Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we are uh, um, uh, doing another interview with the Dr. Oliver Van Oetlen from the Department of Internal Medicine, Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Beth Israel, New York, in the United States. And uh, we will talk about a paper published in uh, Make of Medicine Journal entitled Neurocognitive and Hypokinetic Movement Disorder with Features of Parkinsonism after BTMA targeting partial cell therapy. Well, first of all, Oliver, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. How are you today? I'm very good, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. I, uh, I like to listen to the interviews that you've done with uh, so many inspiring trainees uh, over the past months. I usually try to listen when I'm biking through the city, so uh, it's, it's great to be here. Nice, fantastic. And today I'm glad uh, you're the star of this. Uh, uh, so um, let's start uh, digging into the um, into the paper you published. Uh, uh, may I ask you to give us a little bit of overview of uh, the use of carotene myeloma uh, as to indication, different products, uh, etc. Sure. So I mean, I um, I got into the the myeloma. I got the myeloma fever, so to speak, uh, when I moved here to New York about five years ago. And I think that was uh, was a great time where it was sort of very fortuitous for me because it, it coincided with the period where um, chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy or CAR T therapy really sort of took off for the myeloma field. And in the past five years, when I did most of my research, um, it, it really changed a lot. And I think even though it's not at The, the, we've reached the best possible therapy, CAR-T therapy. It's at a point where I think a lot of people realize it's, it's going to be here to stay. And we're trying to figure out exactly what the position of CAR-T therapy is going to be for multiple myeloma. Um, but to give uh, a little bit of background or an idea of sort of the, the current uh, field of CAR-T therapy, uh, I think there's two, at this point, there's two main uh, treatments that have been approved by the FDA, and I think that have received approval by the EMA in Europe as well. Uh, one is called IDICEL, or the, the brand name is Abecma, and one is called uh, Siltacel, the uh, brand name is Carvicti. Uh, both share the fact that they're CAR T cell therapies that target a, a protein called BCMA or B cell maturation antigen, which is a protein that is expressed. Uh, on B cells and plasma cells as they sort of mature. And, and, and I'm sure um, many listeners uh, know, but just to uh, provide that background, myeloma is a, is a cancer that arises from the plasma cells, which are the terminally differentiated B cells. And so this BCMA protein really looked very promising as it seemed to be mostly limited to B cells and especially in, the, in their differentiated stage as, as plasma cells. And so a lot of uh, research groups and then later companies have, have done great efforts to develop treatments that that CAR T treatments or other kind of treatments that target this protein specifically as it as it allows you to target a tumor and then hopefully limit the off tumor effect. But that is exactly what I think we will be talking about in a little bit. Uh, and so they both share the target. They're not the same product, obviously. And so there's a there's small uh, clinical differences. I think both have been approved at this stage um, to treat what is called uh, relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. So patients need to have gone through multiple lines of, of treatment. I think at least four lines of treatment, if I remember correctly, including the most um, common uh, pre-existing treatments, so that means proteasome inhibitors, that means uh, immunomodulatory drugs and uh, monoclonal antibodies targeting CD38, uh, three classes that have done tremendous, have shown tremendous activity in multiple myeloma, really changed the course of the disease for many patients. But unfortunately, uh, in most cases, uh, patients ultimately, even if they get treated with all available treatments, they relapse at a certain point, then they reach a, reach a stage uh, of relapsed refractory multiple myeloma where we don't have a lot of options. And so in this space, um, the anti-BCMA uh, anti rather or BCMA directed CAR-T uh, received its approval and is currently commercially available. The thing with chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy, um, it basically means that patients have their T cells collected in sort of a leukapheresis process. And then these T cells are genetically modified 
to express a receptor. It's not exactly the same as a T cell receptor, but it's a, a protein that acts as a T cell receptor that recognizes a tumor specific antigen, in this case, BCMA. Um, and then uh, this genetic modification happens in the lab outside of the patients, the product is prepared and then shipped back to the, uh, to the clinic or to the hospital and can be infused uh, to a patient. And obviously that takes some time. So that's something to take into consideration, this whole pipeline of genetic modification of T cells uh, ideally takes, I would say three or four weeks, but we know now in sort of the commercial space that in many cases it's, it's a little bit longer. And that's one of the challenges I think that that's currently there uh, with, with CAR T cell therapy in myeloma is that patient need need to survive through this period of time, this sort of waiting period until their CAR T therapy is ready. Um, but theoretically, it would be three or four weeks, they get reinfused with this CAR T cell therapy, and they get treated. And the, the two products are slightly different in terms of the dose that is being given. Um, but otherwise, I think they're, they're probably, I would say comparable, they've shown very, very high response rates in the range of 80, 90, more than 90% of patients having uh, very deep responses. So their myeloma basically, um, their myeloma values in the blood disappearing. And then uh, in many cases, we have responses that range for um, many, many months. We had hoped, I think, similar to the lymphoma space, where I think CAR-T is a little bit more mature, and there have been many products uh, on the market for multiple years, that you see a fraction of patients that's actually being cured after their infusion with CAR-T. So far, we haven't uh, really seen that in multiple myeloma. Uh, as far, I mean, as far as the data has shown us, I, it's obviously a little bit early to say, because I think the big studies uh, honestly, sort of were rolled out in the 2019, 2020 yeah. uh, age. So the, I mean, we've only had follow up for, for so long, but so far it seems that most patients, unfortunately, even after this CAR T therapy, uh, at some point uh, relapse. Um, and so one of the one of the big challenges now is 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 how how patients after after these relapses can be treated, because as I said options become more limited as patients have, have more relapses. Yeah, especially after um, CAR T, right? So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is the big advantage uh, kind mm -hmm. of therapy that uh, you give to these patients. So yeah, mm -hmm. the big advantage is that in, in contrast to many yeah. other like chemotherapeutic or immunotherapies that we have available, patients get this infusion once and then technically they don't really have to show up in the clinic to be treated. Uh, versus if you get a, a more traditional chemotherapy or immunotherapy, you have to come in every three or four weeks. It puts a big burden on, on many of our patients. Um, but uh, so that's that's more or less the state. And then what is comparable between the two these two products is also their side effect profile. I mean, there's 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 limp, there's I, I guess side effects that are more serious and that have been noted by the FDA as sort of a boxed warning. And I think they're comparable between both products. It includes what is called cytokine release syndrome, which is sort of a hyper-inflammatory state um, that happens early after the CAR-T infusion because uh, CAR-Ts have a tendency to produce cytokines and sort of activate the immune system um, globally or systemically, and that can cause things like fever, hypotension, sort of a SIRS-like reaction. Um, for which there's there's various management strategies, and that's like getting better understood. I I would say this is also uh, like the same. We can say no, but all the other CAR T products. Uh, so we yeah. let's say borrow the management of uh, CRS uh, from uh, the lymphoma experience, right? Exactly, exactly. And and as you said, it's slightly different depending on the product that's being used. It's slightly different depending on the disease, um, but in general, it is something that. Uh, that I, I would say is 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 consistent across like all CAR T therapies and even in um, things like bispecific antibodies that are currently becoming more popular, um, where you use an antibody to link uh, endogenous T cells with the tumor instead of using genetically modified T cells. Um, and then another side effect that I think has been seen across the myeloma CAR T's slightly different from perhaps the lymphoma CAR T's that are available is the uh, what is called icons or immune effector cell associated um, uh, neuro neurologic syndrome or neurotoxic syndrome where uh, 
patients develop some degree of neurotoxicity, usually acutely also after the CAR T, um, where it's, uh, it's interesting, we ask our patients, for example, to write down sentences and to make like little drawings, and then uh, that helps sort of make early detection of when people uh, develop these neurotoxicities because all of a sudden they, be they become unable to like repeat sentences or write down sentences. In, uh, I know for the neurotoxicity, for sure, there is some difference between the lymphoma space and the myeloma space. And it, it initially didn't seem to be as severe, I would say, in many of the myeloma CAR T cells. But then uh, what is different and, and what is part of, of the paper that I, I think we'll discuss in a little bit is the fact that we've seen in the BCMA-directed CAR T space that there's been um, sort of more later stage and more insidious neurotoxicity or neurocognitive and movement symptoms that have um, that have been shown and have been seen in patients that are treated with BCMA targeted uh, therapy and most clearly I would say with with CAR T rather than by specific antibodies or other uh, BCMA directed um, therapies and I think another important thing to notice for myeloma CAR T and and uh, specifically is that we've notice that that there's patients that have like very long standing cytopenias so neutropenia anemia like thrombocytopenia uh, more than you could explain i mean obviously you can explain the fact that if you target bcma you're going to lose your b cell lineage perhaps to some extent uh, and have lymphopenia i think that that would make intuitive sense uh, but we've seen now that there is a good number of patients that have very long lasting um, cytopenias also of the other lineages. And I think that's a very active, uh, an active area of research where people try to figure out how to uh, support and how to help with that. And there's multiple uh, strategies. So that's, I think, a very uh, broad overview of the most common BCMA directed CAR T therapies. I just want to like um, very quickly also mentioned that that researchers have been looking beyond BCMA as a target because the idea of finding a protein on the surface of of your cancer cells uh, is obviously very enticing and, is, and shouldn't be limited to BCMA and so there's been uh, recent publications and there's studies ongoing of of CAR T therapies and and, and definitely also bispecific therapies that target for example GPRC5D which is another protein um, that uh, has been shown to have an expression that is mostly limited or very high on plasma cells and therefore is very uh, attractive. But in in each case, and again, that uh, I'm well, ha I'm happy to talk about that later. You'll see that the expression, uh, even though it's mostly limited to plasma cells, our body has like various uh, interesting and crazy ways to to reuse proteins in other tissues, and that. Uh, creates challenges. I don't think they're necessarily prohibitive challenges, but it creates challenges if we as researchers try to target a specific protein because we think it is um, specific for, for a certain cell type. You quickly discover that, um, that that's not always exactly the case. And um, this is exactly where your paper uh, is uh, uh, can help us understanding a little bit more of uh, uh, this off-target effect of uh, the therapies that we just briefly discussed. So in particular, your case uh, um, is about uh, a neurotoxicity and a specific type of neurotoxicity after therapy therapy, right? So can you tell us mm -hmm. more about the clinical picture of the patient you described and what was his journey? Sure. So... In terms of his myeloma journey, um, I would say he was um, when we saw him for the for the neurotoxicity that we'll talk about in a little bit. He was 58 years old, so it wasn't that it was definitely not old, and he had been diagnosed with myeloma about five years prior to uh, this happening. So at a pretty young young age, I would say myeloma. I, I think a lot of people uh, sort of think of the medium age of diagnosis being around 65 is is the number that I have in my head. So this was definitely a younger gentleman. Um, he had been diagnosed with smoldering myeloma 10 years, so 15 years prior to us seeing him. So he had been living with smoldering myeloma, sort of the precursor stage uh, of the disease for 10 years, ultimately, uh, unfortunately progressed to active myeloma and then received, I would say, um, standard induction treatment with, with bortezomib uh, lenalidomide dexamethasone. We collected stem cells for him, put him on like maintenance treatment, um, 
and then he was on the initial treatment he did well for a couple of years and then unfortunately developed this uh, relapsed refractory myeloma which we talked about earlier and for which he received consecutive treatment regimens kind of with all the standard agents ultimately received an autologous stem cell transplant so he didn't receive it up front but he received it i think in one of the um, subsequent treatment lines which is again um, a standard approach in, in myeloma is to use autologous stem cells that were collected early on in the sort of disease trajectory. Uh, but then at some point he developed this stage where the options were becoming more limited and uh, he, at Mount Sinai where uh, I was working at the time that we had uh, a couple of trials open for BCMA directed uh, treatment and he uh, was eligible for one of these trials. So he was worked up and then ultimately um, received CAR T therapy with one of the treatments that now is um, FDA approved. He was, I mean, doing well uh, in terms of myeloma, his disease completely vanished. Um, not to say that he was cured, obviously, but in terms of like objective parameters, we, we look at um, the paraprotein, which is a marker of, of uh, which is produced by the tumor cells and is a marker that can, can be easily tracked in the blood. Uh, that completely vanished on imaging uh, he had a couple of plasma cytomas which are myeloma tumors that exist outside of the bone marrow that uh, that vanished and so from the myeloma perspective it was doing really well he developed this um, initial toxicity which we talked about uh, earlier called cytokine release syndrome but it was managed sort of in a standard way um, nothing uh, nothing there to suggest there was a, a huge problem but then about three months or so, 100 days, I think, or a little bit more, he, he presents back to our outpatient clinic. We obviously, in the, in the context of a study, we see patients very frequently. Um, and I, I think his initial complaint was fatigue, uh, which, I mean, I don't want to say you kind of brush it over. You're like, OK, uh, I mean, it didn't really like it doesn't really trigger anything necessarily. But as I said, you see them, all, some, some patients we see every week, some patients we see multiple times a week, honestly. Um, some patient, patients I see more than, than uh, my family members. Uh, and so he came with fatigue, but then because we saw him so frequently, you saw that it progressed uh, in a way that I think triggered um, like my uh, sort of like your intuition that something is not, not really right. Uh, and then from from fatigue, it went to sort of short term memory loss again, which is not very objectifiable. And so you're like, OK, yeah, I don't know. But as I said, he was a 50 year old gentleman, so he was pretty functional. Uh, and interestingly, he uh, I, he was a musician like uh, professionally. And at some point he comes in not not much later and he says, I can't pick up my instrument anymore. I just I can't. Uh, and then we were like, yeah, this is really not normal anymore. Right. Uh, so, and so let let, yeah. me, let let me ask you. So, uh, so basically, up until this moment, uh, mm -hmm. he had uh, basically the same journey of any other patient treated with CAR T. Right. Like yes, he's, yeah, yeah, uh, like a good a CRS, good patient. Uh, right. Correct. Because sometimes you have patients, unfortunately, who relapse early on, and you're like, dang, uh, that that's 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 unfortunate because we always hope obviously for patients to have a very long response time and in this case we had a patient he comes back for his imaging after let's say three months and everything's looking great and there's nothing in the blood and we're like you're doing great and like after three months he starts coming in like i feel very bad and we're like no you're great because your myeloma is gone right uh, oh, but like uh, uh, in this case specifically um he developed this uh, like mm, strange like uh, um uh, clinical picture but uh when uh your clinical acumen like say to you well that's something that is related to the car t therapy because as you said he's a male subject yeah nine year old uh, by the time like 58 59 year old uh so I mean, he can develop develop also other sort of like diseases. Uh, meanwhile, yeah, it's not only like his underlying disorder that is the, the reason why you're seeing. So yeah, when what was the the thing that like made you think that's like a side effect of CAR T therapy? I think that's a great question. So uh, I, I would say 
uh, first of all, like his his clinical picture was was very rapidly progressing and didn't really. I mean, I'm not a neurologist, so I will not pretend to be a neurologist ever. Uh, I think uh, I have. I think that's very complicated. I have a lot of respect for them, but I was like, this is not like some like textbook something that I know of. And he had, as I said, initially was fatigue, but then was memory loss. And then he had what like bradykinesia it was like shuffling, but it didn't have like this rigidity and cogwheeling to sort of suggest like Parkinson's disease. But as you say, the question is like, do you right away think it is the CAR T? I think the answer is definitely no, but it's also partly yes. And I think it's a very interesting thing to talk about. Um, especially in people that are involved in like clinical trials, you kind of have to always not necessarily assume the worst, but if you're seeing something and you're like, huh, I don't really know what's going on. That should always, I think, be in the back of your mind at the same time, I think as researchers or as clinical or whatever basic researchers, we are skeptical all the time as well. And so you're like, probably it's not. So how can I sort of rule out anything else? And in this case, I, I honestly, like after the fact, it's easy to say like, oh my God, this was so clear, but no, I think our initial thought was more in the, in it, this could be like some weird kind of infection going on because we know uh, if you start messing with the immune system, uh, unfortunately you'll, you'll make the patients more prone to infection and myeloma patients like at a baseline already because of their dysfunction of plasma cells and that make antibodies, they are already at a high risk for infection anyway. So that I think was the first thing we thought, could it be like some kind of toxic exposure? Could he be taking, I don't know, some, some other uh, medications, supplements, even all that kind of stuff that you don't necessarily know. And then, or could this be some sort of neurologic, like uh, neurodegenerative disease that is more rare or whatever? uh something that only neurologists or uh like um uh movement specialists know about uh and so or could this be i i guess progression of disease progression of disease obviously we we could rule out but you sort of do your due diligence so in this case uh i mean you go to what what can we do to work this up properly we, we obviously did mri imaging we didn't really show much. I think it's it, like we showed that we saw that there were some chronic white matter lesions, which could mean that in the past he had like small little ischemic uh, issues, but that was chronic. It was seen on, on MRIs in the past as well. I, I just noted because it might be important in the discussion of why this happened to this particular patient. Uh, and then what, what do you do? You send him to a neurologist to be like, can you look at this and see if, if this triggers something that you know? Uh, and then, as I said, because we thought about things like infection, but just in general, because you want to like, you want to make sure that you're not missing anything. We send him for a, for a lumbar puncture to, 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 and, and, and to cultures of basically everything that we could culture. Um, and that really didn't show anything, uh, at that point. So the question is, when do you, when are you like, oh my God, this must be from the, from the treatment. Uh, it's, it's. It's a little bit coincidental, as very often or serendipitous in, in science, uh, in the sense that we, uh, because we had at Sinai multiple CAR T trials and bispecific trials, there was an effort that is still ongoing uh, where we have like a, a big translational biobanking effort and we're trying to collect samples, especially from patients that are being treated with these novel therapies to better understand them. And this is in collaboration with our um, immune monitoring core. Uh, which uh, has a lot of like expertise specifically in like immune uh, mediated diseases and immune mediated side effects. And so this started as an effort to sort of better understand probably the cytokine release syndrome uh, happening in myeloma. But so we had a lot of samples from patients on different BCMA directed CAR T trials. And so when this patient became very ill, we could quickly sort of circle back and, and, and take some of the samples for, for patient X and then compare them to other patients on the trial. And I think it all tr was triggered initially by peripheral blood samples. So just like regular blood samples that were banked where we were able to show that in this patient, he had a very high fraction of circulating T cells in his blood were actually CAR T cells. Uh, kind of not kind of surprisingly where you have like more than 75% uh, or more than 80% of all the T cells that he had in his blood were CAR T cells, which um, is not typical. And you don't know if it's not typical. You only know if it's typical or not if you have the other patients to compare it with. And so then we saw like most patients, they have a spike of CAR T cells in their blood, but then it sort of peters off and uh, 
and it goes to very low fractions. But in a couple of cases, and, and his case was not the only case, there was a very high fraction. Uh, and then when we when we characterized the T cells, we saw that they were um, effector T cells that had like high, um, I would say pro-inflammatory cytokines and pro-inflammatory markers on there. And it was sort of like not guilt by association, but that it's all these things that made, I guess, made it more likely that there was um, uh, that there was a contribution of the CAR-T because at some point you start off closing all the other doors and this is the only door that remains open. But I think the most important thing there is just to be cognizant of the fact that it could be related to the treatment, especially if you're working, as I said, in like a clinical trial space, you always have to think of it. Um, and, and then, I mean, do your due diligence and sort of rule out everything else that is going on. And in this case, the neurologist was like, oh, this is very interesting, but I don't know what it is. Uh, and it doesn't look like Parkinson's disease. And it doesn't look like it could be like a, a toxic or a, like an inflammatory process in the brain for sure. And they, they recommended additional imaging um, in the sense, things like uh, ioflupane scans, which is better known as a, a DAT scan, and which looks basically at, at, at dopamine transporters. And that didn't show like an imaging consistent with Parkinson's, but also the clinical, like it, it, it evolved too quickly to be Parkinson's disease. I think we, we, we trialed him with like uh, levodopa, which is a, a treatment used for uh, Parkinson's, but that didn't help him at all, which uh, if we think the mechanism that we think is happening is, is true, that that makes sense that it wouldn't help him. And then um, what we did is additional imaging in terms of like a PET CT, like FDG PET CT imaging of the brain. And that did show that there was some changes in uh, a deep uh, nuclei of the brain called the basal ganglia. And so we were there, there and the basal ganglia are known to sort of coordinate movement, right? Initiate movement, coordinate movement. And so we're like, we see something on imaging uh, and uh, that is consistent with the clinical picture of him having like cognitive and movement disorder, but it is not explained by sort of the, the known neurodegenerative syndromes. There's no signs of infection. So could this be uh, like a side effect of CAR T targeting the basal ganglia potentially? And then we try to see what evidence we would, we would be able to, to gather for this hypothesis. Right. Because uh, um, so you confirmed somehow you try to confirm that this was uh, uh, a side effect of CAR T, mm -hmm. but also as of like your report, uh, um, there were nothing the report the reporting. There was no case uh, uh, as such, right? In the literature sure. after CAR, after uh, yeah. by BCMA CAR T. So what did you um, uh, discover about uh, BCMA and uh, like it's, a potential relationship with the triggering this kind of uh, Parkinsonist kind of picture. Yeah, um, that's a that's an excellent question, and and it's true that at the time when we uh, when we saw the patient, there was definitely no report. I think our report ultimately was the first that was published, but at the same time, the like myeloma is 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 not uncommon at all, but it's as a research community, I think there's a lot of collaboration. Um, there's a lot of like uh, meetings where people come together and share information. Uh, and and so we knew that even though our case was a little bit bizarre and it was like the, the only one, I think, at our center at that time, there were other uh, myeloma physicians who said like, hey, we've had like not necessarily the same, but a similar experience where a patient like rapidly develops this weird movement symptoms and these weird cognitive symptoms. And, and so you, you start to put one and one together, like I, by no means am I saying that this was common. So we can talk a little bit about how common it was. I think, uh, I think we, that would be definitely interesting, but um, it was also not like we heard from other people, similar stories. And so that to us, kind of tipped us over the edge, like, okay, this, this probably is related to the CAR T in any way. And what evidence can we collect to support that hypothesis? And the problem, I mean, part of the problem is like, this is human research. So you're kind of limited in what you can do. This is not like a mouse model where you can basically do whatever you, not whatever you want, but you can sort of determine experiments that you want to do to sort of figure out and prove your hypothesis or disprove it. 
like we were a little bit limited if you're thinking about like CAR T going into the brain, like how, how are you supposed to prove this in a human being? Uh, you can't just like go in there and collect biopsies, right? Like you would, I mean, if it's the bone marrow, you could collect biopsies. If it's somewhere else, you can, you can try to collect biopsies, but the brain kind of off limits. Um, and so we did, as I said, we did lumbar punctures, and then we saw that in the CSF, so the fluid that surrounds the brain, there were like a high proportion of, of CAR T cells in there as well, uh, which again was circumstantial evidence that this might be related uh, to the CAR T. And um, unfortunately, I mean, at some point we were like, okay, this, like, we have so many red flags here. So like, uh, there's so much smoke here, there must be fire somewhere. And I think that sort of triggered uh, our myeloma attendings as well to, to say, okay, we're going to try to um, to kill off the CAR T cell as much as we can using like lymphotoxic chemotherapy in the hopes of like shutting down this process. Um, but even that didn't sort of really help. Again, showing you how persistent or how, um, yeah, unfortunately how persistent these, these, these therapies can be in case things go wrong. There, there, there's no, like, I know there's CAR T cells in development now that have something called like an off switch. So they specifically get some sort of genetic modification so that you can, you can turn them off whenever you want. Um, that I don't think was in place for these CAR T cells. And so we kind of had to rely on using chemotherapy uh, that as a side effect kills off um, T cells to, um, to do it here. Uh, but even that didn't help. And the patient, unfortunately, uh, kept progressing in terms of his phenotype and ultimately passed away. And so this allowed us um, to uh, to talk to the family and have uh, him, uh, like the family agreed for autopsy. The patient had agreed for autopsy as well. And so we were able to collect some of the brain samples and worked with our neuropathology core to show that uh, that there was indeed BCMA expression on some of the uh, regions of the basal ganglia consistent with, I think, what we uh, hypothesized, and importantly, that all that they also showed that there was T cell infiltration in that same uh, region. Um, it was it was hard, and I don't think we uh, like ultimately were able on the pathology samples because again, this these are novel therapies, so we didn't really have a marker to show that there were CAR T cells specifically in the brain. But I mean, putting everything together, that that seemed uh, pretty uh, consistent with the hypothesis and then we circled back and then used again because brain is such a finicky uh, finicky tissue it's hard to get by and there's a lot of like mouse brain everywhere but like human brain is is pretty rare but there are some uh, consortia and there are some databases that have collected RNA and have tried to like map the brain and there's a lot of evidence there, at least in terms of RNA expression, that the basal ganglia and the, the caudate nucleus, which is the, the particular region, region where we saw BCMA in the patient and where we saw the T cells, that it has high uh, RNA expression of, um, of the BCMA gene. And I know from like mouse research, there's some suggestion that BCMA, even though we know it most as a marker of like terminal B cells, is also plays a role in like neurodevelopment. Um, and so I think putting all these things together, uh, kind of, um, the fact that there were multiple patients on the trial with a similar phenotype, the fact that there is, um, some evidence of BCMA being expressed at some point in time in the brain, um, as well as like our samples from this patient who had the unfortunate outcome that he passed away, uh, that I think supported the case enough for us to report it. And, um, and make it known to the to the research community, which I I, I think um, still was an important finding, and 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 hopefully can um, can have an impact. Right. So, and do you have maybe um, because like I don't recall it. Do you know if anybody else has reported this kind of uh, uh, of a side effect on what was the what is the rate in like real world? Yeah. Data if you just since you connect with other researcher also on this topic yeah so initially there was i think from the from the phase one to sort of the early phase study um there was concern that it would be in like the single digit percent so i would say five percent or less which okay. is not which is a small number but again uh it, it definitely is relevant and i think the 
the the different companies that have worked on this car t have done a lot of effort uh to sort of determine what are possible risk factors and there have been subsequent papers about this um and so for example it is known that patients that have like a high burden of disease prior to getting car t that have certain specific characteristics are at a higher risk and so they've they've come up with strategies to sort of mitigate uh, these risk factors as much as possible before sending a patient for CAR-T or before infusing the CAR-T. And that, I think, really has um, decreased the rate. So I, I think it's, it, I would, I mean, it's it's a little bit of a guesstimate, uh, but I would say it's in the, like, perhaps with all these mitigation strategies, it could be in the one to 2% range or something like that. Okay. But it needs to be, like, we need to wait and see a little bit as how it looks like when it's rolled out commercially, because as you know, and as I, I'm sure many people know, patients on a study are uh, carefully groomed and selected. And, and once you go in the real world, there's patients that get this treatment that perhaps are much sicker and, and for good reason, because sometimes you don't have a lot of other options. And so it's possible that that they that the risk there might be a, a little bit higher, but that needs to be shown or that needs to be seen. I think the most important thing uh, here is that a uh, patient should be aware of the side effect and that um, I think our data sort of helped to put it in, in context. Uh, but I think patients should make, like in order to make an informed decision, you should know what the risk is. And especially because we, we talked about this earlier, um, unfortunately, it seems like the current CAR-T products uh, appear not to be curative in the sense that at least the, the large majority of patients relapses at some point. And so you should know, um, you should know sort of the risks and the benefits before going into it. And, and I think this contributes to having that discussion. And, and that would be different if you have a CAR T cell that's potentially curable, perhaps patients are, are willing to take more risks, but if you're not like entirely sure, and, and especially now that there's perhaps other uh, treatment options that are becoming available, um, they should have this discussion. At the same time, I do believe that CAR T definitely has a has a role to play in myeloma, and I I, I know that many uh, many people and many companies are working on improving the CAR T uh, cell product and and perhaps seeing whether moving it to like earlier uh, stages of the disease where the patient's immune system is sort of more capable or less uh, immunodepressed might help uh, increase the responses. Um, the last thing I would say is, is, is also a million dollar question is like, why did this patient develop the, the side effect? If we we're able to predict who, who would be at risk, uh, then again, that would help mitigate this, this potential issue. And, and part of the, the hypothesis could be, for example, as I said earlier, that BCMA is expressed at some time during development of the brain. And so in this patient, we saw he had some white matter lesions and it's possible that he had had some like ischemic insults in the past. And so you could envision that whenever there's damage going on in the brain, as the brain we know tries to repair the damage, we always say that brain doesn't repair, but it kind of tries to. And so perhaps it really expresses some of the genes from its development period, and that makes uh, certain regions of the brain more valuable. That could be one hypothesis. But again, um, we're trying to figure out how to prove this on human brain, which is not easy. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and other work that we're doing is trying to figure out, uh, as we talked about earlier, is like uh, hematologic toxicity after the CAR-T, which also seems to be a common, uh, sometimes prohibitive issue, is like, how can we make sure that patients don't develop very severe anemia and, and, and low white blood cell counts, making them vulnerable to all kinds of other uh, problems late after CAR-T and, and sort of keep them healthy. Oliver. It was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for this overview and uh, um, your insights on CAR-T and myeloma. I really hope that uh, uh, in the future we will have the perfect target for myeloma that doesn't have all these like off-target effect and that you also um, uh, made us uh, have a glimpse of uh, what the future may look like. And thanks also for your um, uh, uh, insight uh, as to the potential mechanism that uh, may have triggered this uh, very fascinating case. Uh, um, 
so i hope you enjoyed being our guest today and uh, yeah absolutely you will keep like listening to our uh, trainee pearls episode in the future i will and i i would recommend everybody to go into myeloma research and myeloma clinical work uh it's it's a great field and it's a great time to be working here and uh very rewarding i i must say i, I i'm very grateful to many of our patients who um who contribute to these clinical trials with 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 their um with their enthusiasm and everything like that so i just wanted to to make that plug because that's they're the most important people in in, in this process and they're making changes for the future that are are really tangible so you're totally right and of course without patient uh, we will not do anything right like so and without their consent to progress with research which is Im important as uh, uh, as the most important thing yes so thank you so much again oliver and uh we'll see uh, each other in another episode maybe in the future who knows <laughs> when you will thank find you for, the, yeah. the target <laughs> okay thank you for having me thank you thank you bye bye